Good afternoon. Today we'll be covering the topic of instrumentation and specifically within instrumentation we'll be looking at pedostatic sources and the airspeed indicator in specific. Before we start with that, a general introduction. We know how important instruments are to our flying. As anyone who's already flown or anyone who's going to fly, we know how dependent we are on these instruments throughout our flight, whether it's for our airspeed, our altimeter, our vertical speed, and even to know engine parameters. There are engine instruments which tell you fuel temp fuel quantity, oil temperature, oil pressure. And each and every one of them is crucial to our flight. And within the aircraft, the especially training aircrafts, there are two main ways these instruments are shown to us. One, as you can see right here, is the traditional six pack, which gets its name because of the six instruments from which usually about five are common for all aircrafts. And then there is the glass cockpit, which is effectively the same thing. As you can see right here, the same set of instruments are in the analog form, but the very same instruments are also shown in the digital form right here. The advantage with this is it reduces the workload on the pilot. We are able to take in more information at the same time rather than having to dart our eyes between multiple instruments in order to obtain the same information. But effectively, in principle, both these instruments work the same way. So as we get before we get started, let's just have a look through these instruments. First, right here, we can see our airspeed indicator. And as we know, the speed is given in knots. Right here, we see the artificial horizon. And the airspeed indicator works on the principle of pedostatic sources. The artificial horizon works on the principle of a gyroscope, which we'll be seeing later on. This is the altimeter. It helps us get our altitude depending on the pressure setting we set right here. Here's another instrument that works on the principle of gyroscope is the slip and turn indicator. It helps us with our coordinated flying. And right here is our heading indicator, which effectively works like a compass and tells us which direction we are flying, whether we are flying to or from. And lastly here we have a navigation based instrument, which in this case is a VOR, but it can change depending on the aircraft. Now the very same thing as we can see is a part of our glass cockpit as well. Now the advantage we have here is we can see everything at the same time. So the entire thing works as our artificial horizon as you can see the brown for the land and the blue for the sky. We have our altimeter right here and our VSI right there. Pressure setting here, airspeed, right here is our slip and turn indicator. These markings here show us the degree of our pitch, our heading indicator right here and these green lines we see right here is our navigational source which here is VOR1. Now on top of this we can see quite a few more instruments here. We can see the radio frequencies that our navigates have put up and our communication frequencies right here, our transponder right here, clock, outside air temperature and so on and we have a mini map right here as well. 
The advantage of a glass cockpit, as you can see, is we get to see all these information at the same time, which helps us by reducing our workload. Some more general information regarding these instruments. As you can see, these are some engine instruments right here. And you can see these engine instruments here as well. On our secondary scene, the MFT. And normally, as you can see, there's the oil temperature, left fuel tank, fuel pressure, oil pressure, and right fuel tank. And as a general rule, if you're in the green, you're safe. Normal operating range. If you're in the yellow, it's cautionary. You need to take care and try to avoid any actions that may put more stress on the said instrument. And when it's red, it's a warning and it's the unsafe operating range. And in most cases, one would be advised to land at the earliest and the safest possible way. Now let's start with the pedostatic sources. So the pedostatic sources are the principle on which a lot of instruments work. For example, our altimeter and our vertical speed indicator both work based on our static pressure source while our airspeed indicator is dependent on the pito and static shows. What this does is it collects data from the aircraft in the form of static and dynamic pressure. Now this data is not of any direct use to the pilot. When this data is processed into information, which we see in the form of our altitude, our vertical speed and our airspeed, that is when it becomes useful to us. So the pedostatic sources are the principal and they collect the data, which is the static and dynamic pressure. And then the instrument or the mechanism in the instrument changes this data into information and sends it to us for our display. So let's talk about static and dynamic pressure. So an aircraft which is on rest on the ground in still air is subject to normal atmospheric pressure as anything else that we can see, which bears equally on all parts of the aircraft. This ambient pressure is known as static pressure. So an aircraft while in flight is still subjected to this static pressure at different flight levels. So obviously when we are at ground level, we experience normal atmospheric pressure and as we keep moving up to different flight levels, this static pressure decreases but is constant from all different sides of the aircraft. Now of course, in the air the aircraft is moving, so due to the additional pressure from the air, airflow around the aircraft, especially on the leading edges, there is additional pressure felt. This additional pressure is what we call dynamic pressure. As you can see the aircraft right here, what we see in red is our static pressure from all different sides. It's the same irrespective of where the aircraft is. And what we see in blue right here this is our dynamic pressure due to the airflow around the wings and the general body of the aircraft. So there's static and dynamic. Now both the static and dynamic pressure together is what we know as pitot pressure. Now if we can rearrange this, we can come to the conclusion that pitot minus static equals dynamic pressure. This is important as we'll see later on because when we measure the static pressure, you know, it's possible to measure just the static on its own. But when we measure our dynamic pressure, the airflow exists, but the static pressure also exists from the same side. So what we are measuring with our pitot tube is in fact the static and dynamic at the same time 
which is our pitot pressure. So since we know both our pitot and our static, we use the formula in order to find the dynamic pressure from it. And as you can see here, the different instruments that work based on these principles, altimeter and VSI, the vertical speed indicator from our static sources, both the airspeed indicator and the Mach meter, which is effectively the airspeed indicator, work on both pitot as well as static. And so this pitot tube is located, as you can see, there's a diagram right here. So in many aircrafts, it's located under the wing and in many bigger aircrafts, it's located towards the nose end of the aircraft. And if this right here is the aircraft structure, there's a tube that extends out away from the aircraft boundary, right? Away from the aircraft boundary and then along the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. So it's away from the boundary layer at 90 degrees and parallel along the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. Now, why does this have to be? one parallel and two away from the boundary layer as we can see when air flows around the aircraft it forms a very thin boundary layer of compressed air that coats the surface of the aircraft now this compressed air as we know with compression volume decreases and because of that density increases and this change in density of air in the boundary layer causes fluctuation in pressure. So the pressure we measure at the boundary layer is not necessarily the same static pressure or the ambient pressure that the aircraft is experiencing. So in order to avoid this error, there's a slight gap between the pitot tube and the surface of the aircraft, and it has to be located outside the boundary layer. And it has to be parallel to the airflow because in order to get most accurate readings, we need the air to flow in directly into the pitot tube without any hindrances and hence it has to be parallel to the airflow. And the third part is since the pitot tube in red as you can see here is a thin tube with as you can see right here in blue it's a tube inside it where the airflow is collected and measured. So the chances of there being water or ice becomes very high especially if, if you're flying in the rain at an extremely high altitude you know water can go into your pitot tube and due to the low temperatures it might freeze and if you block the tube you're effectively not able to measure the pressure anymore and in order to prevent that most of these pitot tubes they have both an eye a heating element as well as drain holes in order to drain the water. We'll have a look at a picture and understand the working of the pitot tube. We see right here. This is a zoomed in version of the pitot tube. Of course, this is connected to the aircraft away from the boundary layer. So the air flows in this way longitudinal axis air flows in the pressure is measured and this pitot pressure sends this data into the aircraft which can be to the air data computer or the mechanism of the airspeed indicator similarly there are slots on either side now these are perpendicular to the direction of airflow this is in order to prevent any air from having an influence on the static pressure. And so right here, it measures our static pressure and sends this data to the instrument. Now here in orange, we can see the heating element, which is responsible for you know, creating the heat and melting the ice in case there is an icing or blockage problem. And we see the drain holes right here because once the ice melts inside, we need a way to drain the water out to prevent smooth, to ensure that there's smooth airflow through the pitot tube. Now, under ideal conditions, 
let me just rub this okay so under ideal conditions the air flows into the pitot tube and out and we measure the static pressure from both sides but as we know we can never obtain ideal conditions in flight because there is bound to be turbulence and there is bound to be winds so due to these winds we may not necessarily have perfect airflow around it and in case we are landing behind another aircraft a heavy aircraft we face weight turbulence and depending on the pitch of the aircraft the airflow around the aircraft does not necessarily have to be longitudinal at all times due to this the typical airflow we face can be seen in the picture below so as expected the pitot pressure is measured the airflow goes in directly but when it comes to the static unlike normal cases or ideal cases where we expect the air to just flow around it in this case there is extra pressure applied on these static boards so this has an effect on our static pressure reading so as we know pitot is static plus dynamic so when there is an increase or decrease in this static pressure it inward directly affects our pitot pressure and since we need both of them in order to obtain our readings which is then displayed in our instruments any fluctuation in these can cause errors in the reading so these errors are mostly known as position errors or maneuver induced errors and it depends on three things mainly the pitch aircraft attitude as well as the air speed these errors are very negligible in calm winds and straight and level flying but let's say we are in the process of having a go around or we are coming into land we are at slower air speeds a pitch down or a pitch up attitude and at that point we are in most cases flying with our flaps set at position 1 or position 2 and this can disrupt the airflow around the aircraft and due to that we can find both position as well as maneuver induced errors so that's the working of a pitot tube we'll just quickly go through it again pitot tube is located outside the boundary layer longitudinal parallel to the airflow with static slots and drain holes and a heating element inside it and the two errors that are most possible with respect to the pitot tube are position and maneuver induced which can affect the readings that we obtain from these so this is the principle based on which the instruments we mentioned earlier work on so let's have a look at one of them in order to understand this in detail so what we see right here is an air speed indicator as we mentioned earlier the red line right here is our maximum speed in this case and red in general means unsafe yellow is our cautionary range which means within this air speed we need to control our speed because we are heading closer to our never exceed speed the green is our normal operating speeds where it's safe to operate the aircraft within these limits and we have one more right here which is white and the white arc depicts our flap operating speeds starting right here with the stall speed at in the flap in the dirty configuration and here is the maximum speeds where flaps can be extended and which means beyond this range if you extend your flaps you're leaving the door open for structural damage
as you can see there are many airspeeds already marked here bne vno we'll have a quick run through them so vno which is right here is maximum normal operating speed as you can see it's the end of the green arc vne is our never exceed speed which means the moment we exceed this speed the aircraft will no longer be guaranteed its safety there is always a scope for structural damage at that point vy is the best rate of climb and vx which is not shown right here is the best angle of climb also these arcs are all dependent on the aircraft obviously some aircrafts are faster so they have bigger ranges while some are slower and they would have smaller ranges this by the looks of it is probably for a training aircraft then we have vfe flaps extended speed maximum flap extended speed then we have vso and s1 both are stall speeds one is stall speed in dirty configuration and one is stall speed without the use of flaps as you can see the starting of the white and the green arcs so now let's head towards the construction of the airspeed indicator this is what is going to change the static and dynamic pressure we obtain from the pitot-static sources into the information that we get in our display either in the analog form or the digital form so this is the mechanical version let me just rub this out okay so the dynamic pressure, the, the formula for dynamic pressure is half rho v square, where rho is our density of the air, 1 by 2 is a constant, and v here is velocity, which in this case is given by our TAS, true airspeed. We'll look through what TAS is uh, towards the end of this chapter, but effectively velocity squared into density into 1 by 2 is what gives us our dynamic pressure we don't directly have to use the formula anywhere but just something to remember in case you're ever asked and two other things to know is as we've discussed already our altitude is inversely proportional to our static pressure within these aircraft operating ranges or altitudes so as we go higher, our static pressure reduces and our airspeed is directly proportional to our dynamic pressure. The faster we go, more air flows into the pitot tube and there is more dynamic pressure. Okay. So as we can see right here, here's our pitot tube and here is our static vent. So the static vent, as we saw in the diagram earlier, was beside the pitot tube, which is possible, but in this case, it's given separately. So many aircrafts have multiple static ports located in areas where there's least likely to be any turbulent airflow to ensure that we get the most accurate readings at all times. And in many cases, there are multiple static ports which are connected together. And this takes the average static pressure and compensates for any unusual reading in any one of the static ports. So the pitot pressure we see right here, if you follow the pink line, goes inside this. This is a sealed bulb. And as you can see, it has a lever attached right here towards these mechanisms. So the seal bulb is where the pressure we get from the pitot tube proceeds to, which means both our dynamic as well as our static pressure is within this bulb right here. So when this pressure increases, it causes this linkage to move ahead 
and when it decreases it causes it to move backwards and this setup is in a closed container right here and this closed container is where the static port opens into so within the closed container we have static pressure and within the sealed bulb we have our dynamic and static which is our pitot pressure this is our pitot pressure so in a normal case scenario when we are doing straight and level flying so our static pressure is constant at a given altitude so the static pressure inside the bulb and outside in the container cancel each other out which means it's only the dynamic pressure which is causing the movement of the mechanism and as we've seen speed is directly proportional to it so the faster we go more the dynamic pressure which causes expansion in the bulb pushes the linkage ahead and turn these gears we see right here which causes the dial which we see on our airspeed indicator to move up which depicts an increase in airspeed it's a simple speed directly proportional to dynamic pressure we, increase, we go faster increase dynamic pressure causes the bulb to expand and which in turn causes the dial to move ahead similarly if we slow down that causes our dynamic pressure to decrease which means this bulb is now getting compressed it causes the opposite reaction within the linkages and it causes the dial to move to a lower airspeed this is the basic working of an airspeed indicator in straight and level flight now the same principle applies whether you're climbing or in the descent except in these cases as we climb our static pressure goes down and as we descend our static pressure goes up either way it always remains equal which means the static cancels out and it's only the dynamic pressure that is actively affecting the movement of this dial which gives us our airspeed so now what happens if these pitot and static ports get blocked or there's a leak within these sealed bulbs or the sealed container so we'll go through this in three separate ways one in one in level flight two in a climb and three in a descent and we'll do this for all scenarios one where pito and static are blocked one where only static is blocked one where only pito is blocked now of course if neither are blocked as we already discussed it should work perfectly fine so we'll go through the first one if both pito and static are blocked now if both of them are blocked there is no change in dynamic pressure there is no change in static pressure and effectively your airspeed indicator becomes useless as it is stuck at whatever it was reading at the time so if you were going at 100 knots and your pitot and static got blocked and at that moment your airspeed indicator is stuck at 100 knots irrespective of whether you climb descend speed up or slow down it's going to remain the same that's pretty straightforward now let's see what happens when either one of them gets blocked so we'll begin with our static board getting blocked let's assume an insect flew in or there's icing and it's blocked the static board while the pitot still remains open 
we'll go with the first case in level flight with level flight so the static pressures are equal because even though it's blocked we're at level flight so there is no change of static pressure your dynamic is still given by a pitot tube and whether you slow down or speed up depending on that the static pressures cancel out and the dynamic is what affects our airspeed which means for level flying when your static port is blocked you expect normal operations straightforward now let's see what happens when we are climbing so now when we are climbing as we know altitude is directly and i mean inversely proportional to static pressure so as we climb up our static pressure reduces but within the container since it's blocked our static pressure here is constant let's call this s2 and let's call this s1 so as we climb s2 is greater than s1 which means under normal scenario the static pressures would cancel out the pressure difference between the bulb and the container but now because s2 is bigger than s1 there is more pressure from outside than from inside it does not mean the bulb is getting compressed it just means there is more static pressure outside than inside which means the effective work that your dynamic pressure is doing in order to move the linkages here is reduced so your airspeed indicator will underread let's go through it once more your static is blocked and your clamping s2 is greater than s1 the pressures don't cancel out and this restricts the expansion of the bulb due to the dynamic pressure and this causes the airspeed indicator to underread when we descend is the exact opposite we go into a descent and in this case s1 is greater than s2 because s2 is constant and s1 because we descend has now increased which means the effective static pressure is working from inside the bulb causing it to expand more than it would which means the effective movement would be expanding more than it should be because of this pressure difference this would cause our airspeed indicator to overread it's just the exact opposite of what happens when we climb up when we descend s1 is greater than s2 which causes overreading now we've covered that and we now we'll have a look through what happens if our pitot gets blocked so our pitot is blocked our static works fine so now what happens is our dynamic pressure is constant as well as our static pressure again we'll go back to s1 and s2 and that's our dynamic pressure which is now constant and first scenario level flight you are in level flight s1 equals s2 dynamic pressure is constant so if you're flying at 100 knots and your pitot gets blocked you're going to remain at 100 knots it's not normal operations your speed just gets stuck which means whether you slow down or you speed up it's not going to make any difference to the dynamic pressure as you just remain at the same airspeed you were when your pitot got blocked it's straightforward and easy s1 equals s2 they cancel out your dynamic pressure is constant because not changing so your airspeed indicator dial is just stuck where it got blocked now let's see what happens the second scenario we're climbing so as we know when we climb our static pressure decreases which means s2 is reducing because our static port is open 
and s1 remains constant so means s1 greater than s2 now we apply the same logic as before dynamic is constant s1 greater than s2 which means there's more pressure from inside the bulb this causes over reading of the airspeed indicator because there is more expansion than there should be similarly when you descend the opposite scenario where s2 is greater than s1 and this causes more compression than required within the bulb and causes under reading now there's a table right here just helps us go through it so now here are the three scenarios level climb and descend and this right here so here static is blocked p doors open level flight is normal climb you under read descend you over read similarly if your static is open and p doors is blocked level flight constant air speed climb over reading descent under reading and in order to remember this easily there's usually the acronym pud sort which is quite simple way to remember it pedo blocked under read on descent static blocked over read on descent quite simple i'll repeat it pedo blocked under read on descent so pedo blocked under read on descent and for the next one static blocked over read on descent quite simple now there's one more scenario left is what if there's no blocks but what if there's a leak so assume everything is working nothing is locked but there's a leave leak right here and static pressure is you know getting leak right so if your static pressure is leaking you have two different variations here it can be an unpressurized aircraft or a pressurized aircraft now if it's an unpressurized aircraft due to the static pressure leak your let's say let's call this s1 and s2 again which should be equal in normal cases but due to the leak s2 is reducing so s1 greater than s2 and of course if s1 is greater than s2 there is more pressure from within the bulb and it causes over reading so if your static is leaking in an unpressurized aircraft the static pressure reduces s1 is greater than s2 and it causes over reading while if it's in a pressurized aircraft then depending on the pressure outside your air speed indicator will not be working properly because if the pressure outside is more than the static pressure it will cause it to overread or underread depending on whether the pressure outside is more or less so if your static is leaking in an unpressurized aircraft overreading if it's in a pressurized aircraft your air speed indicator is no longer functional as for if the pedo is leaking then there's a leak in the pedo pressure which means there's a drop in pressure inside the bulb and the expansion is reduced because there's lesser pressure within the bulb causing the expansion so that causes under reading so pedo leak is under reading and static leak for unpressurized is over reading see given right here as well now let's look at the final part so as we've seen how the airspeed indicator works 
and how the pleistocratic sources help in making this work and we've already discussed there are plenty of errors that we can face along the way it can be position maneuver induced and then there can be errors in over reading or under reading because of the pto getting blocked or the static getting blocked or leakages within the system so overall when it comes to air speed indicators we have five main errors first is the instrument error inbuilt errors maybe the dial shows three or four knots lesser than the accurate reading at all times or maybe there is a slight leak within the static system which is observed and in these cases these are inbuilt errors so what is normally done is there's a placard which is placed saying that the instrument this is not just for an air speed indicator it works for all instruments instrument error is inbuilt and if it's not if you are unable to correct it you usually keep a placard and which says uh, it's over reading by 5 knots or it over reads by 10 feet or 100 feet or so on that's the instrument error now position and maneuver induced error we already discussed earlier on in the pto static section exact same either due to the position of the vent or the pto tube or due to the speed of the aircraft the angle of attack or the maneuver or the excess yawing which can reduce or increase the airflow around the pto head there can be difference in reading and these are the position and maneuver induced errors we discussed earlier now the fourth one is compressibility error as we mentioned earlier this is the aircraft body and air flowing right around it we discuss about the boundary layer so within this boundary layer there is compression of air happening this in turn changes the density and due to this change in density we can find fluctuations of pressure if the pressure reading is taken from within this boundary layer or close to it because of course our aim is to keep the pto head outside it and at extremely high speeds of 300 knots or above this boundary layer and the pressure due to it is enough to cause slight fluctuations to our pto reading and so this compressibility error is negligible in most cases but when you're going about 300 knots then it can start to have an effect on our readings and now the last one of course is our density so as we know all these instruments are designed for use under normal conditions ideal conditions which is ground level 15 degree temperature you know and ideal pressure as well but as we know air, flying an aircraft is not always done in ideal conditions you're up in the air at flight levels so there's change in density change in air speed change in temperature and altitude all these can have different errors with our reading because the instrument has been calibrated for ideal conditions and the errors formed due to flying in non ideal weather conditions is what is called as density errors so all these errors exist in the indicated air speed which is what we see in our dial all of these errors are included and as we keep correcting for each of these errors our we can move from our indicated air speeds to different types of air speeds we'll have a look at it right here so first and foremost we have the indicated air speed number 1 and when we correct this for both position and instrument error or rather we calibrate it to compensate for the position and instrument errors which is inbuilt as we know so on calibration of it for those errors we get what is known as cas the calibrated air speed and as we've already discussed compressibility error 
only exists above 300 knots. So now when we take our calibrated airspeed and correct it for the compressibility error, that's when we get our EAS, also known as equivalent airspeed. So what we're doing here is we're taking each of these airspeeds and correcting them for an error one at a time. So after we get our equivalent airspeed, then we move on to correct it for density, you know, change in altitude and temperature, which in effect changes our density. This gives us what we call TAS, the true airspeed. Now this is the airspeed your aircraft is moving at when you compensate for all these errors, the actual speed of your aircraft. Now the only thing that can affect this is wind, which is if let's say you're going at 100 knots of TAS and you have a 10 knot headwind against you. So effectively your speed is 90 knots. So your true airspeed is 100, but your effective speed or the distance you cover is 90 knots. So 90 knots becomes your ground speed, which is your task corrected for winds. Now so at the same time, if you have a tailwind of 10 knots, this suddenly becomes 110 and so on. So majority of flying is done with our indicated airspeed. And when you plan for a trip, Let's say you have to travel a hundred miles within you know, your, your speed is a hundred knots and you have hundred miles to travel. So as we know, it's going to take us one hour of flight time. Now this hundred knots can be your task, but maybe due to the headwind, it's, you know, our effective speed is only 90 knots, which means we're going to take longer than an hour to reach there. And so we should plan for fuel accordingly. So in case of fuel calculations and timings, ground speed and TAS are very important. As for general flying in terms of our approach speeds, landing speeds, stalling speeds, we always use our indicated airspeed. So that covers the basics about airspeed. Just have a quick run through from the start before we end it. Static and dynamic pressure together gives us our pitot pressure. Working off the pitot head, you don't need to learn it by heart, just have a rough idea of the parts of it. Ideal airflow versus typical airflow and types of errors. This is important. Questions based on errors and in instruments usually come up. Both errors, principle, as well as working. You need to know all the V speeds. If not all, at least the major ones. Normal operating speeds, rate of climb, angle of climb, flaps extended and stall speeds. Working of the airspeed indicator. There won't be any direct questions on this usually, but it's crucial you understand this because without this, it becomes very difficult to understand what happens in all these cases. Remember to learn the acronym would help it'll just save you a lot of time in the mcqs five different types of errors and how these errors have changed the airspeeds remember to know all the airspeeds as well as what error each of them change uh, an easy way to remember that is another acronym so you can see it goes this way so it goes like iced tea is a pretty cool drink. I C E T P C D. So iced tea is a pretty cool drink, and you have your indicated airspeed for position and instrument, calibrated airspeed, corrected for compressibility, you have your equivalent airspeed, corrected for density, and you have your true airspeed. And true when you correct for wind you get your ground speed. So that's it for today's class and thank you.